The announcement of this talk was a little bit strange because um, I gave a, a talk like this with the exact same title, a custom system plugin per project um, in the Joomla in Netherlands. And that was quite basic because I wanted to uh, allow for system integrators to also uh, understand the talk. Um, then I copied the same talk, but just changed all the slides except for the, the starting slide. So actually in the program, it's, uh, it's saying it's uh, an integrator talk, uh, but actually it's a developer talk. So how many of you are uh, not developers? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to explain all the steps anyway, and it's um, it's meant like to to show you um, uh, what you can do with uh, with plugins. It's it's showing a couple of examples, um, but my major reason to, to actually have this talk is to show also the developers uh, smarter ways actually to build uh, plugins, uh, reuse code for different kinds of uh, projects, and uh, it's also showing a concept that is uh, known as uh, mix-ins. So how many how many of you guys are known or, or familiar with uh, mix-ins? Yeah, I was expecting only to see a couple of hands, but still I'm going to explain the whole concept of a mix-in with uh, some example code, so that's going to be uh, interesting. Well, to um, introduce myself, um, no, to introduce the slides, they're online available already, so you can just uh, go there and uh, check them out. Um, my name is uh, Jesse Reitsma. I have my own uh, company called uh, Yurio, also sponsoring uh, this event. And uh, last year I finished a book called uh, Programming Joomla Plugins, which is about uh, programming Joomla plugins. Um, well, it's, it's um, one of the concepts I had with, uh, with uh, learning more about plugins is that you get a base example of a plugin, so uh, like a plugin a skeleton, uh, available online. There's, there's many different guides. There's, there's uh, uh, various tutorials that take you to, through the steps of creating a plugin, doing certain things with it. But actually, the documentation was always lacking in uh, one thing, that is uh, explaining everything about uh, plugins. So I took up the, 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 the challenge of writing a book, uh, and I, I started off with like, well, I can write a book maybe of uh, 50 pages. Well, in total, it's uh, 268 pages. Um, so it's, it's dealing with a lot of different uh, aspects of, uh, of plugins, all the different events. Um, so it might be interesting if you're uh, starting with uh, development. It might be interesting if you're um, already experienced with uh, with Joomla development. Uh, currently, it's only available as a as a printed copy. So if you're interested, after the talk, I'm still um, uh, having a couple of the copies uh, available. Um, this August or September, depending a little bit on how fast it goes, I will also develop uh, an ebook which will be available through Amazon, Kindle, and, and channels like that. I'm also uh, proud to be actually uh, a part of the, the Z team. Uh, Zend, that's the, the, the PHP company. So when PHP evolved as a programming language, it was actually uh, developed by a company called uh, Zend, located in, the, in Los Angeles and uh, Tel Aviv. And they've come up with a couple of products which are uh, awesome, like uh, Zend Server. So with Zend Server, you can have a development environment uh, running in, in Windows, Linux, Macintosh. Uh, um, and based on Zen Server, you can have, uh, uh, well, you can easily integrate any application you want. And what they di recently did with uh, Zen Server 8 was integrate uh, or add, uh, add a profiling tool called uh, Zray. Um, and Zray actually adds like a toolbar to every Joomla website that runs within the Zen Server. So if you want to have a profiling tool as a developer, find out uh, which queries are executed on which page. Uh, you just take up the Joomla application, dump it in Zend Server, and then suddenly Zray is, uh, is showing you all the all the neat stuff. So I extended that Zray functionality also with uh, with uh, Joomla functionality. So knowing about MVC, knowing about uh, J layouts, knowing about what kind of request data are actually within within a, a Joomla request. So it's um, the, and the plugin is available for free. Zend Server is also available for free. Zend Server. Um, plus Zray is actually a commercial product, but there's a trial version for two weeks or one month. I just forget all the time. So you can just run a trial to see what, uh, what's up. Um, well, that I'm writing a book and that I'm getting, giving this, uh, this, this talk is also part of a bigger uh, picture I have to, uh, to organize um, things to educate people or, uh, on, uh, on uh, Joomla programming. So I'm organizing with a couple of other guys uh, for instance, Roland and uh, Sander, I'm organizing physical events 
And actually, um, my goal is to take this talk, to take the knowledge of the, the, the book I wrote and combine it into a partly free, partly commercial uh, education package online. So not really like a competitor with OS training, but like a good colleague of OS training. Cool. Um, this talk is about um, plugins. It's about specifically, it's about uh, system plugins and it's, it's more about orienting um, how, can you, how can you write or why should you write actually um, a custom plugin for a specific project? What kind of code would you add into it? Um, and one of the things that, that I do often is, um, uh, well, I don't do that many custom projects anymore, but I'm involved on, on the sideline. And then a customer wants to have uh, some kind of uh, CCK-like functionality, meaning that actually uh, a Joomla content article is not enough. You need to add a couple of fields extra. Um, and well, what, is, what, what has been a known topic actually in the Joomla world is that we can add a CCK extension and replace the whole content uh, infrastructure of, uh, of Joomla, replace it with uh, something like K2, like Flexi content, uh, Sublow. Um, but instead of doing that with a full blown CCK, you can also do that with a Joomla plugin, simply by adding things to a thing called JForm. JForm is like an object oriented approach to forms. So that's dealing both with the form output, the generation of HTML to create a form, or it's also um, uh, dealing with the posting of the form, meaning also the filtering and the storage of, uh, of all the data. So um, when dealing with custom projects, um, the custom demand I often see is, hey, can you add a certain field to uh, a Joomla article? Because uh, it's easier for us to, to use uh, that content. We have certain content editors and you don't want to, for instance, you're, you're building a, um, a book catalog. So every book has uh, content describing the book, but it also has, author, has an author field. It has an ISBN number. Uh, it has all these different fields that are specific for a book. So instead of just dumping it into the, the, the body of the article, you actually want to have separate fields for all those uh, different data. So you can just use um, a Joomla plugin to add those fields to your um, environment. I'm going to show you some code that is actually dealing with that. Um, I'm also going to show you that actually that code can be very generic. And that's like the second step in my whole talk um, about uh, mix-ins. Because if we can make the code more generic, we can reuse it um, for every project. So while we're actually dealing with custom work, custom programming, we can still use big chunks of that code, um, reuse it, place it on GitHub, share it with others. Uh, so mixins is like an attempt to create a kind of architecture to um, create reusable plugins for everybody. And an attempt. So uh, Joomla plugins. Uh, normally, I would um, would like take half an hour to discuss this, but actually, I want to get to the code quicker. Uh, so, how many of you have created a plugin in the past? Most of you. Well, to briefly explain uh, plugins to the, those that, that didn't yet, uh, a plugin is well is always uh, uh, grouped into um, a certain group. So we have uh, content uh, groups, we have a system group, we have authentication group. And a plugin is basically a plugin class. So we're dealing with PHP objects. Um, and within that class, you can define a method. And that method has a certain standard. And if it's starting like with uh, on content prepare, actually the on content um, gives like the impression or it's, it's like giving the intention, hey, this is an, ev an event. Um, and a plugin can react on this event by declaring its method to have that name on content prepare. So within the group uh, content, um, various things might happen. Uh, you might uh, save an article, you might uh, load an article from the database. Uh, you might be just showing a single, uh, uh, sing single part of that, that article, like a title or the body or et cetera. And every time when something is happening to that article, uh, you can, uh, or, or actually Joomla is uh, generating an event and you can react on that event. You, you can do stuff with that event by um, uh, creating a plugin uh, and reacting on the trigger of that event. Now, the confusing thing is always, um, you should see it like that, that there's a component, most of all, most of all cases, there's a component that um, does something and that, that doing something is followed or preceded by a certain event. 
Um, and as soon as that event is, is, uh, is uh, triggered, then this event can be um, uh, picked up upon by a plugin. So that's actually the, the whole architecture. Now, um, when the thing is triggered, we call it an event. But when we're dealing with the plugin that is reacting on that event, it's not actually the event itself. It's an event um, fetcher, interceptor. And I always say, like, well, it's an event method. So on one side, you have the plugin event. On the other side, you have the plugin event method. That is actually the same name. But we should distinguish between the two because the event might be a single instance of on content prepare, but there might be different uh, plugin uh, plugins that are reacting on the same event. So there's uh, one plugin event. There might be multiple plugin event methods created by different plugins that are actually reacting on the same event. Um, now, the tricky thing is actually um, within plugin events and event methods because they have the same name. Um, we have, or we try to have a certain kind of convention and this convention fails in Joomla. So the convention should be that actually every event starts with on, on something happens. Um, the second part should actually be the group where this uh, event belongs to. Now I'm mentioning three groups in the top, content, system, authentication. And actually, when we look at the, um, the, the plugin methods itself, uh, we can see on content prepare is starting with on, so that's good. But it's also uh, mentioning the group name, content. Um, so that's, that's like fitting into the scheme. Um, on after initialize is, is an event that belongs to the system group. So there you can see actually that, that the convention already starts to fail with Joomla. Um, because it should actually be something like on system after initialize, identifying the plugin group immediately. And on user authenticate is actually confusing as, uh, everybody because we have a user group of plugins and we have an authentication group of plugins and they all share the same prefix on user. Well, conventions, awesome. Um, some extensions, they start... Um, to use their own conventions even by generating events that start with get something. And within object-oriented programming, it's, it's perfectly right to uh, start a method with get something. We love getters and setters. Um, but actually to start an event with get something that is terrible. Um, so I recommend that as soon as you encounter um, a component or plugins that actually imp implement events um, that are starting with get something, uh, that you mail that uh, extension developer and, and, and tell them about the conventions that are actually within Joomla uh, because it's just uh, confusing. <laughs> now, another thing that is actually confusing is that um, the whole talk of groups, so plugin groups, content, system, authentication, is actually um, bullshit. Why? Because actually um, the only thing that is happening by dividing all the plugin, uh, plugin events in different groups, it's, it's like an organizational thing. It's not a technical um, dividing. Um, so if we look at on-content prepare, uh, the only reason why on-content prepare is actually starting with on-content is to identify that event as part of a group of events that are supposed to do something with content. Um, but it's perfectly possible actually to, to create um, an authentication plugin that actually intercepts on content events. So that's kind of confusing. So again, um, the, the system itself has a convention, but it doesn't mean really that you can uh, need to stick to that convention. Well, I, I advise you, of course, to do. Uh, so if you're writing a content plugin, make sure that plugin is actually only intercepting on content um, uh, methods. If you're writing an authentication plugin, actually the plugin should only contain on user authenticate uh, because that's the only plugin event in the event group authentication. Um, there are actually good reasons why not to uh, stick to those standards. And one good reason is, for instance, the prof profile plugin. So within Joomla, there's a profile plugin which belongs to the group of uh, user plugins. And what this plugin is doing, um, once it's uh, enabled, it's actually modifying, modifying different content forms. So it's modifying the form to add in new fields like the date of birth, gender, 
uh, website. So extra fields that every, every user can, can, fill, can fill in are actually added automatically by this plugin. But by doing so, it also needs to store that information. Um, and the information is actually stored as part of the user itself. So um, whenever the user is being saved, the profile data is also being saved. So from that, the profile plugin belongs to the user group. But the, the profile plugin also needs to modify forms. And forms on the technical level are just seen as um, content. But it's just that the content is not displayed as an article or whatever. No, it's displayed in a form. So actually, you can see that the profile plugin is acting, is doing two, two separate things at the same time. It's um, modifying forms and it's doing something with users. It's belonging to the user group. So that's why it's allowed to modify the user um, uh, stuff. But actually, it's also uh, part of the content group because it's modifying forms. So then you can see there's actually a really good use case why actually one plugin belonging to a certain group um, is acting actually on behalf of another group, is, uh, is reacting on plugin events that belong to uh, on content, so content events. So that's, that's kind of confusing. But it's also um, kind of uh, saying like, hey, but this is how Joomla works. And it allows us also to um, reuse code in a better way. So one reason why there, are, there, why there is uh, a plugin um, uh, called the profile plugin that is actually both modifying forms and modifying users is that, well, if we separate the functionality, we suddenly have two plugins, making it more complex to use. So to, to make sure all the related code lives in a single plugin, we, we forget about the standards for a moment and just say like, okay, all these plugin events, um, whatever we need to have this plugin working, um, we use it. Now there's a catch. Um, when you're authenticating a user, um, the user logs in. So there's a form and then the user enters a username and a password, submits the form, and so the, the form is, is posted to Joomla. And at that moment, the controller of the user component takes in and does authentication. So very early in the bootstrap, before actually any rendering of content is being done, um, authentication happens. And to make sure authentication um, is able, or to make sure authentication plugins are able to react on the authentication event, the Joomla framework is loading those plugins. So whenever the on user authenticate event is being triggered, so the, the, the user component knows like, hey, but I want other plugins to, to influence this event. I'm triggering, triggering this event called on user authenticate. But before I do so, I'm initializing all the different authentication plugins. So actually, when you're triggering an event in a component, you're always um, having to do two things. First, you have to load explicit, explicitly which events are going to use or which plugins are going to be used for this event. Um, and you're going to trigger that event. So when on user authenticate is being triggered, just before that, all the authentication plugins are being um, loaded. That also means that at that point in time, the content plugins are not loaded yet. So if you're trying to write a content plugin um, by and, and adding functionality to that content plugin to authenticate, it will fail because that plugin will not be loaded yet in that point of time. So it's always um, uh, important to understand the whole bootstrap of Joomla to really understand like which event is triggered at what point in time so that you can know well, actually, to, to um, change something in the content, normally I would use a content plugin, but I can also use a system plugin. If I'm, um, if I'm dealing with authentication uh, and I'm writing an authentication plugin, um, whenever I'm authenticating, that plugin will be loaded. But after that authentication occurs, it will not be loaded anymore. So if I'm using an authentication plugin to trigger something or to react on triggers based on content, it's not, not working. So make sure you carefully choose which group belongs to which um, plugin or which plugin belongs to which, which group and make sure it fits, fits all. Now comes actually the whole point of this story. A system plugin is always loaded. So when um, the system of Joomla is being initialized, this uh, on after initialize event is being triggered. 
So whatever event comes afterwards on user authenticate, on content prepare, we don't care. Any event that occurs after loading Joomla itself will um, have the, the benefit of actually all the system plugins already being loaded. So system plugin can fetch any event. So instead of dealing with content plugins, instead of dealing with authenticate plugins, we forget, you know, forget about the whole story and say, well, we're going to write a system plugin that works. Well, if you're a really extension developer, don't do this. But if you're writing a plugin only for a specific custom project, this is useful because we don't need to wonder, um, hey, but which, which um, event belongs to which group? And uh, I'm trying to write a content plugin, but are the right plugins already loaded at that point in time? We can forget about that whole story and just say, well, system plugins always work. So if I write a system plugin, I can react on any event that ever occurs in Joomla. So when I'm talking about custom projects, always stick to system plugins and then you're done with it. And this is actually showing it. Um, so this is a plugin class. Um, it's defining the variables uh, app and DB to be used uh, internally. So there's a reference to the Joomla application. There's a reference to uh, the Joomla database. Um, there are three public methods that are um, intercepting events. So they start with on something, on after initialize, on content prepare with a bunch of parameters uh, afterwards, and on user authenticate. So actually this plugin is now able to do the three tasks or three things at the same time. It's doing something with uh, the content, like uh, an article that is being shown uh, on screen. It's doing something with uh, authentication and it's something uh, to do with, well, just after the system has been initialized. Um, interesting also is that um, I've, um, I've added a couple of uh, extra methods, like do something generic and um, do something um, more specific or very specific. Um, and the reason why I added this is also because the, the keyword or the access modifier protected and private um, is also indicating the importance of such a method. So if we're dealing with event methods, so the ones starting with on something, they always have to be public. Why? Because the plugin class is being called from outside of uh, the, the plugin class by, by Joomla. So Joomla needs to access this class and it can only be accessed if um, the, 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 the plugin method is public. But actually this, this on something generic, oh, that's more generic and actually only our plugin needs it. So we make it protected. It can be used in this specific plugin. But if somebody else writes another plugin based on this uh, plugin class, uh, that person can still reuse, do something generic. So that's nice to share the code and etc. And we're coming back to this, this modifying uh, thing, the, the, the access modifiers, where we're dealing with uh, mix-ins. Uh, and of course, when we're doing something really specific, we just declare our uh, method as uh, private because we don't want to share that code with the rest of the plugins or the rest of the world. So it's actually by choosing the, 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 the access modifiers, protected public and private carefully, we're also making a declaration about our class like, hey, this is our class. This is the interface we have to the outside world. So that's the, the public methods. And all the protected uh, properties are actually like a communication. Like, um, hey, all other extension developers, I created some cool stuff. Maybe you want to reuse it. And private is declaring like, well, I created this for myself only, and it's not usable by anybody else. To... Um, to, well, the, this is more or less the same story, but to distinguish a little bit between um, the, the public and the private uh, methods, I always refer to um, the events that are being used to do something with the plugin events as event methods. And actually, all the other methods are helper methods or, well, do something else method, methods. So that's the terminology. Um, for, for whom was this really easy? For whom was this uh, interesting? For whom was this uh, mumbo jumbo? <laughs> mm. Okay. <laughs> I'm not British, but I love the expression. <laughs> cool. Next level. Um, modifying forms. 
uh, JFORM is this uh, object-oriented approach within Joomla to uh, modify, um, uh, modify forms or create forms in actually two different ways, through PHP code and through XML code. Uh, and what we can do is actually modify existing forms. So anytime when you're actually in Joomla and you're seeing a form, um, most of the time it's actually dealing with JFORM. So for instance, a login, um, a login form in a module in the front end, I believe that's, that's not really JFORM, but that's more like custom code, HTML, PHP. But if you're dealing with a content creation, art, uh, content creation form, that's definitely JFORM. So whenever you're dealing with a form in the back end of Joomla, that form is actually based on JFORM. And because it's based on JFORM, we have generic methods actually to mo modify that form, to um, add new fields to that form, which is easy, um, delete existing fields, which is uh, a little bit harder, but still doable, or modify the existing fields. For instance, saying like, hey, this parameter is norm normally, um, it's, it's not uh, mandatory, but I make it a required field. So how we're going to do this? with um, an example XML field, uh, XML file. This is defining um, a fields um, collection within a form and within this fields we have a field set and within the field set we can add uh, fields. So you can see this is XML, it's resembling a little bit HTML and it's not that easy or not, not that difficult to, um, to add. Um, this is not going to be a story about JFORM itself, um, but it's just showing you like, well, um, I can do this. Um, I can add new fields by just defining uh, XML uh, code and just, just watching, the, mon watching the, the documentation a little bit. There's different types of form fields. So there, there's a select, there's a, a date, there's a color picker, etc. So you can create uh, cool stuff with it. The second thing of a form is actually when we've defined uh, this XML file, we can uh, use PHP code to add this XML file to an existing form. So what we did in the previous one was we located the, the existing field set called attributes, attributes and added a new field to it. Um, and as soon as we merge um, uh, this XML code into the existing field, actually we hope there is uh, an existing field set called attributes. And if there is, there's some the test field uh, added to it. Um, the interesting thing is actually um, this is um, naming form twice, like the name form. First of all, it's um, adding a form path called form. Um, so if you put this in a, in a plugin, the plugin is living, for instance, in plugin slash system slash example slash. So, so within that plugin folder, there's uh, an example.php file, an example.xml file. The XML file is needed to install the plugin. So that XML file actually is similar to template files, uh, XML files to define uh, the template. So once you've modified uh, the template details, that XML file, you also uh, be able to, uh, to modify that XML file. But actually, because that XML file is already in that folder, um, if we add our JFORM XML file in that same form uh, folder, we actually have two XML files, and Joomla might consider this, this new JFORM file as an extension definition. So then we get this weird error like, hey, uh, we found this XML file. It's not really an extension definition, but it looks like an XML file anyway. Something has gone wrong. Well, to prevent that error, we just move this XML file with the form to a subfolder, and I always call my subfolders uh, forms. Yeah. Yeah, so actually there's, there's a load data um, uh, method to JFORM, and actually that's allowing us to uh, create a string with XML code and just insert it into, um, insert it into the, the form. That, that's what you mean, right? So in this case, the data path is form. So you can it from the user main, for example. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so th that's one thing I didn't cover. Data is an array with, so form is the first parameter to the function, um, and that's a reference to the JFORM object. Uh, data is, uh, in most cases, it's a, an array of data, uh, but it might also be an object, so you need to check for whether it's an array or it's an object, but that's containing the data of the current content. So if we're uh, modifying the article, actually the article data is contained in this uh, data uh, thing. 
if um, if we're adding actually no, I, actually, I'm, I'm not going into more de details about that, but you're correct. So there's a whole story actually about, um, hey, I have this XML file, which is defining new fields, but how do I make sure that whenever I load this new field, actually the value stored for this new field is also inserted into that new field. So it's like um, if, you're, if you're adding a new test field, this is the code to add the test field itself. And once you hit the submit button, there needs to be different uh, code to actually store that value somewhere. And if that somewhere uh, is, is, um, is if, if the value is being stored somewhere, you also need to retrieve it again to actually insert it again. So that's, this is like a very simplified version of how plugins actually work with forms. But it's showing you also another thing. And that other thing is actually that the PHP code here, it's two lines. Well, in most cases I actually use like 10 or 15 lines to make sure that form the variable form is actually j form so if it's an empty variable i want to make sure that my code is not being executed um, what i also do is uh, check upon the data to see like uh, is this a data array or is this a data object so it's example code what you can also see in this example code is that one when you want to add new fields actually we only need to go back one step and add that field to this XML file, and the PHP code stays the same. So in other words, mental note, the PHP code, the method itself is generic. The XML file can be custom per project. And that's actually the reason why I'm showing this. <laughs> mental note. Um, we're going to repeat this mental note a couple of times just to see like, hey, but we can extract the function functionality we actually need and put it into more generic code. And when we have more generic code, we can reuse it more uh, easily. So another example is um, adding CSS code. Um, how many of you is, um, is familiar with uh, something similar to this? It's, uh, it's showing that um, there's a CSS folder um, and actually the, 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 the jfactory get document uh, method uh, retrieves the, 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 the object referring to the current document and we're um, assuming here that this current doc document is actually an HTML document. There should be extra checks as well to make sure this is not a, um, a feed document or a PDF document because then adding CSS code doesn't make sense or actually will corrupt the page. So we need to add, uh, again, different checks, but this is like the generic code you can, uh, can imagine. Now, um, in the previous step, actually this, this plugin method to add um, uh, an XML file to a form was uh, generic. So it could be copied and pasted to any plugin and it would still be working. In this case, the code is not uh, generic anymore. It's actually containing the name of our plugin. So, when we're dealing with uh, cleaning up our code so it be, might become uh, reu reusable for, uh, for other projects, uh, we want to, do, um, we want to differentiate between the different tasks uh, something is doing. So a method should only have one single task. And if we have less dependencies per method, um, we can use that method over, uh, over and over again without um, needing to modify things. So if we go back a little bit to this method, um, there's actually, uh, well, one place, the CSS folder uh, variable that's now containing the name of our plugin. So if we make that more uh, generic, if we find a way to automatically fill this uh, variable, then we can reuse the same code. Um, so that's like refactoring this method. And we also can see actually that this method, therefore, is doing two things. It's defining the name of our media folder, and it's defining also which CSS file should be added to the document. So that's actually two things that are now bundled within one method called on after initialize. So we're going to refactor this a little bit by adding a new method called add CSS. And actually all the code that used to be in on after initialize, we just move it over to the second uh, method. Um, so this is like the first step up, uh, uh, step to, to clean it up uh, a little bit. And what I also did was uh, make sure that the file parameter in this, uh, in this method um, can be set uh, dynamically. So instead of just adding a default.css, we can now use um, a bootstrap3.css file. 
And of course, we can take it up a little bit further by just removing the entire dependency with the plugin name. Because this plugin uh, or this file, actually, uh, the, the method lives in a file, and the file lives in a folder, and the folder is specific for the plugin. But if we can detect the folder name, we can also detect the name of the plugin. So if this is an example plugin called example, then we can actually go to the base directory of uh, the current folder and get from that base directory finally the name of the plugin and the plugin group as well. So now you can see actually that the dependency with the name of the plugin and the type of uh, plugin group is, is removed entirely. And this whole method called add CSS can be moved to another location to be reused for every project we want. And actually, the only custom code that lives now in our plugin is the first line, add CSS with our argument uh, default. So now th th this is actually the, the direction I'm heading to. Like we're, we're dealing with plugin code, which is useful to reuse. But actually, if we want to reuse it, we don't want to modify those lines of code every time again. We can make it such a way that actually um, it's reusable. Is it already that fast? No. <laughs> they had enough of it. So this is actually the, the way you can, um, you can uh, deal with the, the different uh, plugin methods. Um, back to the, the previous one. Um, the add CSS method is actually now doing a lot of different things. It's determining the plugin folder. So not defining it as a static variable anymore, but going back to the parent of the parent folder and then determining based on that whatever plugin we're dealing with. Uh, and it's adding the CSS code. So by adding more and more of these methods, we actually can clean up the code further and further. So then actually we have a get CSS folder method that is only doing one single thing. Look at the current uh, folder of this, uh, of this plugin and determine the plugin name out of that. And the more of these methods you have, the easier the, the, those methods can be reused in different uh, projects. So the mental notes, again, it becomes more and more generic when we do refactoring. Um, this is actually another um, purpose of a plugin. Whenever the HTML page is being modified, um, there might be a few things that you actually want to change in that HTML page. So for that, we would use uh, the on after render method. And every time when I deal with uh, su such a modification, I always have the three steps in that, that, mod in that modification. I'm going to fetch the current body, so that's containing the, the, the HTML markup. I'm going to do something with that, and then I'm going to insert that same modified HTML back into the document. So that three-step model can be represented by these three lines of code. But again, I've um, replaced all the, all the custom code, so the stuff I'm actually doing, um, I've replaced it or added it to another method called replace tags. So again, this code is really easily, uh, easy to read. All the custom code has been moved uh, somewhere else. And that custom code could look like this, a regular expression to go through um, the whole uh, body document. And this is actually from, this This is a font awesome example from uh, the Joomla Day Holland. So I created this uh, plugin available on GitHub that is actually implementing the font awesome icons um, by uh, searching for, uh, how do you say that, the, the, the ring all uh, curly braces. Uh, so it's starting with a curly brace followed by the keyword FA a space, and then an identifier of the icon you want to insert. So if there's a Twitter icon, you could say FA space Twitter, done. So instead of all the, all the HTML, you can just dynamically load, uh, load this plugin. Um, it's not finished. This is not a complete example, so that's why the to-do word is there. But it's again showing you actually that um, the solution could be very generic. So replace or generic, the solution could be very specific. Replace tags is now doing a certain thing, searching for a specific tag called FA, and doing, then doing some kind of manipulation on top of that. We can extract this, this functionality again and again and again. And every time we, we do it, we are, um, uh, uh, we are creating new methods, while the original methods actually become very generic and reusable in all the code. Um, authentication plugin, same thing. 
Um, it involves a little bit uh, more code, but actually what you can see here uh, is there's an on-user authenticate uh, event that is receiving as an argument uh, credentials containing the username and the password. And why do, we, why do you want to have an authentication plugin? Well, because you have a certain method to actually authenticate those details. So if you're only wanting to validate whether the username and the password is correct, you could use another function for that, the validate method. And the only thing the validate method needs to do is actually, well, I have a username, I have a password. This is either correct, true, or incorrect, false. So that functionality is not shown here. But what is shown here is the other responsibility of an authentication plugin. Because whenever the validation is correct, uh, a plugin method or a plugin uh, within the authentication group also needs to insert the status of this authentication into the Joomla framework. So that's another, uh, that's another functionality which is shown here by manipulating this, uh, this response. So this is the generic code. So whenever you create an authentication plugin, you can just copy and paste this code. And actually the real custom code is something like this. And of course this is um, stupid. It will always fail, but it's showing like, hey, but this is where my custom code belongs to uh, or lives. So now we're getting to the whole point that actually, time, uh, actually every time when we're um, reusing code, we're actually um, uh, creating uh, the original code that is reusable and new code that might be specific for our specific needs at that moment. So a custom plugin per project could contain a lot of copy and pasting, but a smarter way to do that is actually to create a bunch of methods that are always the same and a bunch of methods that are specific to the project. So how do you separate those two? Um, a possible solution for that is uh, mix-ins. Um, mix-ins is, uh, is something that has uh, existed for years uh, within PHP. It's not really like a solution built in PHP, but it's more like something you can build with PHP. Um, and it's comparable to a new thing called traits. Um, well, new? How, how long does, uh, did, did PHP traits already uh, exist since? 5.4. So that's about uh, one year, one and a half years ago, I think. Um, traits allow you to define a class. And what we just saw was there's a plugin class. So that's a normal class, um, object oriented. And this class contains variables and methods. So what we can do with a trait is define a new type of class. But instead of our original plugin class extending that, that new class, we're actually reusing all the code. And using code means actually that all the methods contained within the trait are inserted automatically within the plugin class. So when, um, going back to code sample. So for instance, if we would have created a trait called authenticate. So there's this trait class defining on user authenticate. Then actually, if our plugin class is extending or is not extending from this class, but is using this trait, then it's automatically intercepting the event called on user authenticate. So we don't need to write any more about um, all this code. The only thing we do in our plugin class is say, hey, we're authenticating. So whatever it takes, we just want to authenticate. And then the trait could actually say, well, we're, we're authenticating this way. And the only thing you need to do again in your plugin class is define a validate method. So normally when you see an authentication plugin, it's always doing two things. It's always dealing with the response the Joomla way and it's doing the validation. But actually by using a trait, we forget, you can forget about the Joomla way of, of dealing with response and only focus on that validate function. So we actually we clean up our code. We only say we want to use authentication and because of that we also need to define uh, validation. Now the bad thing about traits is actually um, it's supported for 5.4 or later so unless you are very sure that actually um, your project is going to run not 5.3 but 5.4 um, you're, you're actually having a difficulty. So instead of actually dealing with traits I'm dealing with uh, mix-ins. <coughs> 
And actually, because of these mixins, I can show you directly what's being done under the hood to make this uh, possible. So we're now actually switching to um, a code demo. So I'm going to sit down later on. But this is the, the base example, actually, what I created. So the first lines within the class um, is that it's it defining a mixin array. And through this array, it's actually defining, I want to do something. And whatever it takes, just give me all the methods that are needed to do that. And actually, the only thing that I need to do then in on after render method is call upon a certain task. So if this would be my entire plugin, um, it's, it's only like involving, uh, well, about 10 or 12 lines of code. And it's really easy to read, assuming that you know, of course, what do some task actually does. So that's another challenge in naming the methods uh, properly. So we're going to implement this with, um, uh, with custom code. <coughs> so the, the code I've uh, written is also uh, available on uh, GitHub, so you can check it out uh, later. Um, oh, that's, uh, that's for later. Um, and just to show you, um, I'm now here in this uh, source folders with um, plugins file, uh, plugins folder, system folder, and this is my custom plugin. It's containing like the necessary files for a plugin to load. So there's an XML file, there's a PHP file, and then we're getting actually to the, the custom folder and the mixins uh, folder. So going through the, the code itself, um, like first we're starting with uh, some mandatory stuff about, uh, about uh, commenting and a, and a check for the JX variable. And now I'm doing something different that is normally not in plugins. Um, when you're creating a plugin class, that plugin class needs to extend from the class called JPlugin. So when you're creating a class, always extend from JPlugin and then you have a plugin. Um, in this case, I'm extending from another class called uh, Plugin System Custom Abstract. So all the functionality that I can reuse is actually stored in that other class. And I'm also um, defining some uh, mixins. And actually, this is almost like all the mixins I created as an example. Um, there's a checks folder. And within the checks folder, um, I can insert all the classes responsible for doing anything doing with checks. So one check I often have to do is actually see like um, if, if the current request is an AJAX request. Because if I'm inserting a CSS file or a JavaScript file, I don't want to have an AJAX request uh, being handled at that moment. So um, checking whether there's an AJAX request or not allows me to quickly deal with this uh, also. The same way for the front end ch check. I always will want to check when I'm inserting CSS. I want to check whether the current application is the back end of Joomla or the front end of Joomla. So again, all the functionality of checking that is put into a thing called mixin. And from within that mixin, the only thing I need to do is call upon that code. So the magic actually happens within this method. It's the on after render method. And actually what I'm doing here is I'm not inserting any CSS code, but I'm checking whether the current request is an AJAX request or not the front end. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm not doing anything. So as you can see, the check itself is just a method. But the main point here is that the method itself is not shown in this class because, well, I don't care. It's not custom code. I don't need to worry about it. So the is AJAX request is so simple. Uh, I could, could use uh, PHP unit testing for that to, to make sure it's simple and working. Um, but it's, it's like a logical name. And if I call upon this, this method, Everybody can read like, well, if, if this is an AJAX request, you are returning false. The, the code is simple and clean to read. The second thing it's, uh, it's doing, it's, um, it's checking actually whether the, um, the HTML body is containing a tag. So starting with uh, a curly brace, followed by foobar, followed by space and something else. And whatever match is being found in the body with foobar, is being returned into an array of tags. So the whole, the whole thing of regular expressions, I don't need to worry about it anymore, it just works. So I've created reusable code that allows me to focus on doing something with tags without actually dealing with the, 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 the regular expressions anymore. So how is this working? 
well, if, if all the methods are defined here or are being called here, so AJAX request, then it has to come from the parent class. So the parent class is, um, oh, 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 oh. please go away. Yep. My uh, mouse is a little bit stuck, which is not. Uh... So is AJAX request is actually defined in the abstract parent. And this abstract parent, which is right here. Uh, can I use uh, tabs? No. <laughs> Alt tab. Control tab. Yeah. Cool. Well, I lost my mouse, but we still can read the code. So this, uh, this abstract um, uh, class is not containing the, the methods we've seen before, because actually what, I'm, uh, what I want to do is whenever I'm checking something, I want to, uh, to have that code live in uh, a folder called checks. And I don't want to have one parent class that is containing like hundreds or thousands of methods that I might use or might not use. So I want to keep my co code very clean. So the only thing actually this method is doing is implementing mix-ins. Um, and because we're almost running out of time, so I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it simple what the mix-in actually is on a code level. Um, whenever a method is being called within an object, um, PHP looks for that object, makes like an internal listing of all the methods that exist in that object. And whenever that method is not found in that object, it calls upon a magic method called underscore underscore call. And by default, this underscore underscore call method does nothing. So when PHP encounters an object, is looking for a method X, and underscore underscore call is also not returning anything useful, you get a PHP fatal, fatal error saying this method does not exist in this object. So then the thing crashes. But in this case, I've overwritten it and said, said well, whenever you have a method that you can't find in this object, actually use my thing here, to, um, to go to another class and use the code from there instead. So going back to uh, the question then, which class? <laughs> I have a mouse, so I hope actually that the, the problem is going to be solved uh, like that. Um, so it's actually, yeah. So it's actually hooking into the functionality here that there's a simple array defining all those other classes. So I've defined now to, uh, to a PHP, whenever you can't find a certain method, instead go to these classes, checks Ajax, checks frontend, actions, actions tag, and uh, make sure that those classes are actually um, mixed in to the current uh, object. So those methods are also mixed into the current object and are Callable. So, whenever this method is actually being executed or is being called upon, this method does not exist in our current class. So, PHP goes into my mixin method, and actually, there's a class called Ajax, and there the code is actually living for this is Ajax request. So, as you can see here, there's a bunch of lines to correctly detect whether the current request is an Ajax request or not. But instead of having all this code, uh, all this, this, these 20 lines of code within all my plugin code, which is like occupying a lot of space, I've moved it to another class, cleanly like um, uh, moving it over so I don't have to think about it anymore, and I can reuse it whenever I want, simply by defining in my plugin that I actually want to use the class, and by copying the class file to the right location. Um, well, for the, the techies, the, the, the nice thing about this is it's actually uh, uh, detecting whatever class is right there um, by uh, using PHP reflection. Because when I'm inspecting another class, um, uh, I don't know which methods are actually static and which are not. Or I don't know which methods are actually public or private or protected. But because I'm referring from uh, the plugin class to this new mixin class, I only can reuse the public methods. So I have to um, inspect this, this new class, this mixing class, to make sure that I'm not calling a private class from within my plugin. To do that, I'm using a thing called um, 
PHP reflection, which is, um, well, nice code to actually build uh, a mechanism like this for, uh, for mixins. So the same thing that is true for Ajax is also true for the front end. So I've moved um, all the functionality of how to detect whether the current application is actually the front end or the back end. I've, I've all stored it into the separate class. Um, this class is something I can reuse or you can reuse also in every project you want. And the only thing you actually need to do is define, um, define a plugin class that is extending from this magic class called plugin system custom abstract. Um, copy all the files from the folders checks and actions and, no, I'm saying it wrong, all the files from this custom folder and this mixins folder to your own plugin folder. And then suddenly you have all these different objects, um, object methods that you can reuse and, and apply to your own project. So what I've then done now is um, I've done a couple of checks and I've done one, one action which is actually referring to the part that I'm, that I'm reusing a, a regular expression to search for certain tags in the body, replace it with, or get an, uh, uh, get a, um, uh, get an array out of that with, with all the responses. So that's right here. But as you can see, all the complex code is stored like in a, in a class deep, deep away. And the only thing you need to do is actually call upon this parse body tags method with a certain string. So that could be FA, it could be foobar, it could be the, the name of the tag you've inserted in all your content. And the only thing you need to do is actually also, you need to, do, you, you need to know that its input is this string, the output is an array, and the output can then be re re reused in, in every way you seem, uh, seem fit. So this was like a, an example of how to use mixins to make your code uh, reusable. Um, on the other hand, it was also like a, a, a little bit of a practice of how to refactor code that looks uh, custom made and actually um, split it up into methods that are very generic and methods that are not generic. So those methods are really the custom work. And by doing that, actually can re you can reuse the code all over and all over again. Um, so that's it. Um, the slides are available online. Um, the code is also available on, uh, on GitHub. If anybody wants to uh, ask me some questions uh, later on, uh, I'm, I'm still here till uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the talk and uh, thanks.